Hello and welcome to this week's Health Report with me, Norman Swan. Personalised medicine is an area that's been pumped full of hype in recent years, promising to create individualised treatments for a whole range of conditions, including cancer. But can we actually target treatment to individuals like their magic bullets? Is the best route to that treatment through the study of genes and our genomes? And does applying this technology actually improve outcomes? Interrogating these issues is a fundamental concern for the future of medicine. And to help explore them, the World Science Festival in Brisbane brought together a panel of experts, which I moderated in March. On the panel were David Bunker, the Executive Director of Queensland Health's Genomics Programme, Dr Nick Waddell, Head of the Medical Genomics Group at QMR Berkhofer Medical Research Institute, and Dr Shirak Patel, a clinical geneticist with Genetic Health Queensland at the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital. So, Nick, just take us through. What is the genome? What are we talking about here before we get on to personalised medicine? So, DNA is basically um, base pairs, which is the recipe for all cells in your body to be what they are. And so it's a recipe that would tell a cell to turn into hair, to turn into skin, to turn into parts of kidneys and so on. And so it's the recipe book that drives the body. And so it makes a thing called RNA and then proteins and tells the cell what to do. And so we inherit DNA from our mum and our dad. We get a bit of both, and that's why we sometimes thought to look a bit like our mum and our dad sometimes. And the DNA, it, it kind of gives us, for me, it makes, probably makes my eyes blue. It probably turned my hair grey when I was 15, and so that sort of thing. So it, it tells us a little bit about ourselves. And so the, the DNA it really came into the forefront in the 90s with the Human Genome Sequencing Project. That's where it's decided that we're trying to sequence and try and determine what that recipe was in the human genome and what and, and what and it's it not one continuous strip, it's in the <coughs> chromosomes. That's right. So we've got 22 chromosomes and we also have two sex chromosomes, which are X and Y. So female, XX, uh, male, XY. We hope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and relevant to this conversation... Not the whole of the genome has the code for your know, hair and eyes. That's there's correct. a coding part and then there's a non-coding part. Yeah. And that, that does, that it's important to understand that when it comes to gene testing. So the genome, it's um, 3.2 billion bases, but only 2% so of it. So by that, bases, you mean the letters of the, the letters, code? The letters, yeah, the A, C, T and G, the letters that we use, just the alphabet. And so, um, but only about less than 2% is actually deemed to be coding. That's the things that will make that protein that makes cells do things. But the rest of the genome is thought to be what's termed non-coding. It used to be called junk DNA about a decade ago, but we now know it's very functional. It's full of regulatory regions. And what that means it is it actually drives all the different dynamics of all of that coding region. And it's exceptionally important. So it controls the genes in many ways yeah. and, and, how the, and how it all happens. Correct, yeah. So when you talk about genomic testing, so there's direct-to-consumer stuff that's going on with 23andMe, Ancestry.com, which might cost you 99 bucks. You might be a patient at the Princess Alexandra Hospital, you know, the PA, and you've got cancer, and they're going to do your genome sequence. Mm -hmm. There's lots of different ways of doing this in different depths. Just describe almost like a consumer guide to genome sure. testing. So there's very different types of tests and they're actually quite difficult to ascertain what they're testing sometimes. So if you take Ancestry.com test, all they're doing is they're looking at specific base positions and so they may assay a few thousand single points in a genome. But these are points that they can use potentially to tell you where your lineage is from. So they're so like they're landmarks. Specific, yeah, very specific points. So they're, we call them common polymorphisms. Whereas um, if you move on to, you can have, in the clinical setting, you can have a single gene test or even just a hotspot. So it might be a very relevant variant that's seen a lot in disease, and so there may be a little test for that. Um, or you can do a screen an entire gene, which is a footprint in the genome, or you can screen panels of genes or all the genes. And you can go beyond that and screen the entire genome. So and that's so called whole genome whole sequencing. Whole genome sequencing, yeah. And, and so the scale of price will go up because you need to actually assay more and sequence more. So in a sense, Ancestry.com and 23andMe is like a scattergun approach. It's a snapshot, yeah, but nothing right. in great detail. That's you, correct. Not yeah. a lot you can hang your hat on. Yeah, and very little discovery in that. But when you get genomic testing, let's say in Queensland, it's not usually the whole genome sequence. Let's talk about in the hospital system. Mm -hmm. It's not usually the whole genome. No, it's, us it's usually genes or panels of genes or in some cases an exome. It's not usually a whole genome, yeah. So a whole genome cost to raw sequence data will be about a thousand US dollars. 
whereas jeans and panels will be tens to hundreds of dollars. So there's a difference in And when cost. you say panels, this is, again, just, I just want to, so we absolutely understand what mm -hmm. we're talking about here. You might have a cancer and they might want to know whether you've got a variation in a gene that they know tr is affected by a yeah. particular drug. Yeah, and that's so frequently seen in that cancer. So yes, you, you're likely to or find Or there might it. be an unusual one. That's right, yeah. Now, why doesn't everybody coming through the system, say with cancer, get their genome done? Is it just cost or is, or is it a waste of money anyway? Cost comes into it. We have to be realistic about the cost of delivery of healthcare. But I think what's more relevant is the clinical application of that test and its usefulness in that disease disorder condition. So it really has to be led by clinicians who are saying, this is a relevant test at the right point in time for this patient in terms of a diagnosis that's gonna give us some sort of additional information about how to treat that person. So it's really important that when we talk about genomics in the health system, as opposed to, you know, sort of the commercial testing or wellness testing, or um, I heard someone call it recreational genomics. But in terms of healthcare and medical delivery, this is really Chirag's area, is to say, how does that piece of information make a difference to the care for that patient and support the clinician in that interaction with the patient that helps to get a more effective diagnosis that's more accurate, more precise, maybe more personalised, if you like, and then what treatment comes and follows that. Because it's not necessarily straightforward how to interpret it. So you might get a full exome sequence, all the genes done, but it sometimes takes a panel of experts to actually look at that data and work out what the heck it means. Mm. So I think in the clinical setting, when we're talking about these genomic tests, as Nick has said, we see lots of variations. We're, we're all made up of millions of variations. Some of them just make us normal for our family or for our particular ethnic group. So when we're applying these tests to patients, there always has to be a question asked. So they presented with a particular condition and we want to work out why have they presented with that disorder. So the data has to be analyzed not only from the laboratory side, but from the clinician's inputs, you know, providing that input of what the patient has to then marry up that data with the patient. So we've got a, the correct answer for them. So the story is linked. I mean, and the, the analogy here is testing people for you know, cancer screening, for example, is not a diagnostic test mm. because you don't know the person's mm. story. And to actually diagnose whether something's abnormal, you've got to know what the story is that mm. they've come in with. So some of these are what we call incidental findings. So I think in the, in the pediatric setting. I see a lot of children with intellectual disability. We're applying these newer genomic tests to try and help them get diagnoses for those families, but we're not giving them answers of whether that child is at risk of cancer. That is all there in the data, but it's not being looked at. It's sort of filtered out because that's not the primary clinical question being, being asked. Is that ethical? Well, that's very interesting, but um, I guess for the healthcare system and for the patients and their families, when you speak to them, they actually don't necessarily want to know what this could mean from an adult perspective for that child. So that all comes down to consent when you do these tests. So consent's very important, David, because if you are doing a test on this child who's had an intellectual disability or you're not sure what the problem is, and you do find that there's a cancer risk, we don't have a Genetic Information Protection Act in Australia. That could affect your ability to get life insurance, future, that child to get life insurance later in life. Yeah, potentially. And it's really important that we separate health insurance from life insurance. These are very different things, and they work under very different models. Health insurance really falls within this concept of universal health care in Australia, and we have an amazing health care system here. The idea in life insurance is, and this is where the complication is, is around the regulation of that market and the expectation that people and the government have of that industry in terms of whether it's relevant or not to ask that question and whether a person should provide that information. So Work you're supposed to tell them if there's a family history of heart disease, but in fact, yeah. if you don't know your genetic test results, you're not obliged to tell them. But if you do know your genetic tests, you are supposed to tell them. Yeah. This is a really good point because you're obliged to answer the questions that are put forward in the form, and that may include your family history, which is going to, without having a detailed genetic test, is going to tell you a lot about what may happen with you depending on certain conditions that are highly hereditary. So, so we're going to get on to the personalisation part of this, but this is really important because you've got to do a test to personalise. So what sort of barrier, Nick, is this knowledge that you could actually influence other parts of your life or other people in your family if you come up with a particular genetic profile before you even do the test? I think it could be a barrier for sure. So particularly if um, you're thinking about doing a test, for example, um, 
Am I at risk of breast cancer because it's running in my family? Could there be other implications that I might find? If it was me, it would be up to the individual if I want to know about those other things. And also, if you know you're at risk of something, in how many instances does it actually drive change in people too? And I think that's a really important element to consider as well. Which was, which was one we'll come back to. Let's talk about the wins here in personalised medicine and what we've got out of it so far that creates this expectation that something marvellous could happen here. Nick, what, what sort of wins are there yeah, being? Yeah, so I might talk in the field of, of the cancer space then. So cancer is very different. So what we've been talking about uh, currently is your germline DNA, the DNA that, that, that is you. In cancer, what happens is that DNA can acquire changes and mutations, and that can actually break gene function. And it makes the cells behave really, really badly and makes them grow, proliferate crazily, and eventually form a tumour. And so in cancer, what we're trying to do, we're trying to find all of those additional mutations that have occurred, because those additional mutations, they will, they will actually tell us, um, well, one, why the tumour is potentially occurring, why it's growing, and also potentially how to treat it. And so if you think 40 years ago or so, or a few decades ago, having a diagnosis of cancer would have been terrible. Whereas I think now we're, we're getting more tumours where a diagnosis is people would say, oh, I'd rather have that cancer than that cancer. And that's because they're being treated better. And so some of those treatments are due to genomic precision type approaches. And so classic cases are HER2 positive breast cancer. So there's drugs available that target that specific So we just explained, this is a block and key mechanism on the outside of a breast cancer cell. That's correct, Which, yeah. if it's positive, potentially increases the growth That's right. of that tumour. There is a drug that can block that. That's right. And there's other examples in melanoma, there's a BRAF inhibitor and things like that. In lung cancer, there's other examples and leukaemia and so on and so on. And these examples have really facilitated improved outcomes for patients. In some instances... Is that personalised care or targeted care? Targeted care, but it's personal to that person's tumour. What's happening now is there's a shift now from trying to move away from, okay, this is a melanoma, so we treat it like melanoma. Now it's looking at what the genome is of that tumour. And so for the case of HER2 and breast cancer, we can see there's other HER2 positive tumours that are not breast cancer. And there are now clinical trials ongoing, particularly in the US, there's a very large clinical trial called NCI Match. And they're really finding that other tumour types with this genotype are responding very well to similar therapies. So you're treating the genes rather than treating the part of the body where the tumour happens to be? Correct, yeah. And last year, FDA approved a drug in this sort of space, changing the shift of how cancers may be treated. What about in children and paediatrics? So I think where genomic testing has helped uh, children is really access to diagnoses. So I've been in sort of doing clinical genetics for over 10 years and the, the technology has advanced so much that we're now able to apply these tests to patients in clinics where previously they weren't able to have a diagnosis. They've gone through years of you know, expensive investigations, lots of hospital admissions, and now having a diagnosis allows them to sort of plan the future, potentially knowing what the condition is, we can tailor what other medical illnesses they may be running into. Do they need additional surveillance? It limits the number of investigations they can have. And in particular disease groups, we're starting to see that when we understand what causes the disease, we can repurpose existing drugs. So uh, examples would be for genetic forms of epilepsy in some of these children where they're on three or four different medications, their epilepsy is very badly controlled. If we understand what the underlying gene and the mutation is, there may be a different drug that actually works much better for that group of patients. And this whole idea of repurposing drugs is emerging in cancer as well. Where yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Can you give us some examples of that? So I've already talked about a few of them, but it's basically taking a drug that has shown some efficacy or not for a certain condition and then using it in different tumour types. And it might so, be in heart disease, not exactly, necessarily yeah. in cancer. Yeah, correct. And facilitating it. Yeah. And that's been illuminated by the genetic susceptibility to that drug being discovered on genomic testing. Correct, yeah. yeah. You're listening to ABC RN's Health Report with me, Norman Swan. And today, we're exploring the idea of personalised medicine with a panel of experts recorded at the World Science Festival in Brisbane in March. So, talk to me about this personalisation at a mass, at a system scale. It's interesting. So, the point about, is it really 
targeting or is it personalised? I think one of the things that the health system is rapidly evolving to in a personalised sense is where that patient's experience during that process. So this is a very clinical discussion, if you like, about what's happening in terms of a point of diagnosis and treatment. But as we all know, when we're patients in the system, we spend a lot more time at home and dealing with these sort of things. So I think the ability for the system to be able to respond to the, the information that a, a patient brings to that conversation with the clinician. So in terms of precision medicine, personalised healthcare, if we think of where devices start to come into um, healthcare, so I think it's not long before clinicians are starting to consider prescribing devices, apps, those sorts of things where a person can respond something in a little bit more scientific method about how they went with a particular drug, what was their experience with that, did it make them feel nauseous, those sorts of things, rather than coming in to see a clinician going, oh, I think I had this problem, I had a bit of a headache last week. So there's a, so a far raft more of more than data. The That's kind of where I'm leading is that the genomics is really important, but we have to think about it as another tool in the clinical clinician's tool chest, and also where the patient's information comes into that as well, so that when we talk about patient-centric care, and I think this is why people lean on personalised care rather than precision, even though both the US and the UK would much rather talk about precision medicine at a clinical level, it tends to be described as personalised. targeting. Exactly. So when Obama, you know, talked about the precision medicine program, he really referred to it as a personalised medicine program, because it makes a lot more sense to people. So tell me about your research. Yes, yeah, so my, my research is it's pre predominantly on cancer genomics, and so we take patients who have undergone a diagnosis of cancer, we have tissue from the patient which is derived from the tumour, and we get normal DNA which is normally from blood. And so we do whole genome sequencing, so we're sequencing all the junk as well as the coding, um, but the junk is not junk. And so we sequence the individual's germline DNA, and so we can see all sorts of things that we, we don't look at there in, in, in that sort of context. And then we sequence the tumour to find all those broken mutations that are there. And then so in our research, what we do is we take all this sequence data, and when you're sequencing, it's like many volumes of an encyclopedia, you put it through a shredder, that's what the sequence machines do essentially, we fragment the DNA, put it through a shredder, and then you try and reassemble it again, and that's how we do the analysis to get back to someone's genome. And when we do that for cancer, it's like removing a few letters from a page, making a few errors, ripping out a whole page, putting it through the shredder again, and we're trying to find all of those things that have You're happened. You're not inspiring in confidence. In <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but we, we, we've done this for it's for quite a few years now. So, so we, you, you we, think we're you know how to? We're we getting good at it. You sell it to so actually yeah, pull right, it all together. Yeah. When Nick says we, what she means is a whole team of bioinformaticians yeah. and a lot of yeah. computer grunt, a That's lot right, of computer yeah. power. Yeah, a lot of people can work on this. So when you've looked at individual tumours like esophageal cancer or a mesothelioma yep. or others, what have you found? So we're really trying to mine those genomes to see if we can repurpose drugs for those disease types or if there's a slight indication they're responding to treatment. So mesothelioma, there's a slight indication people may be responding to immunotherapy. We go and mine the data to look for genome markers that actually dictate that. So then in the future we can figure out, one, why people are responding. Can we use that as a test way down the line in the future to figure out who will respond? But also for the people that are left who are not responding to those therapies, is there something else in their genome that might... So have we got any examples at all where we're curing or extending life significantly so as a result? It, it, it's very difficult. So yes, there are definitely survival benefits for patients, but some of them are very short. And the reason why they're short, and when we're talking short, is maybe six months, a year. And the reason why it's short is because the tumours are actually developing resistance. And so that means that the cells that have those mutations, they're either changing enough that they acquire different mutations and they now can ignore the drug, or there's a group of cells that were never going to respond to the drug because they have a different set of mutations right at the outset and these now grow out. And, and the issue we're having is a lot of the clinical trials have been performed very late stage cancer. These are patients that have normally undergone three or more therapies already. They're very late stage, very difficult to treat. And so seeing any indication that there may be survival benefits in that group of patients is promising. And we now need to work back and push some of these back into um, earlier stage disease and see what the efficacy is there. I mean, one of the issues here, David, is, I'll come to the pediatric one in a second, is that the drugs that you're uncovering here sometimes cost $100,000 a year. And as Nick just said, finding one gene that's gone wrong and you treat or you, there's a high mutation burden, mm -hmm. which means that the tumour is very active and you could, maybe this new immunotherapy could yeah. attract it, is that you tend to treat with one drug. When cancer is like HIV, you should be treating with multiple drugs. Each one of costs 100,000 bucks a year. 
can we afford it? Are we creating, yeah. creating a big hole for ourselves for the this, pharmaceutical industry? So this is why it's so important that when we're looking at the discovery and the clinical system, we understand how the health system works. So a drug is funded on the prescription benefits scheme. So when you go to the chemist and it's only a $6 drug and you think, well, how do they come up with that for $6? It's because the government are basically funding the real cost. And those drugs that go on the prescription benefits scheme are funded for a particular use. And so if a drug can be used, but it's not on label, then it comes with a cost. And, and this is one of the challenges for the system. How effectively can it respond with the disruption that we are basically facing? And, and genomics is one of those very significant disruptors of the system. What we need to do is have our health system be a learning system so that it's better able to capture these learnings, that it can change more rapidly, but with the efficacy uh, and ensure that those procedures are accurate and correct and are not going to do damage. Uh, and so this is the challenge. If they ran a clinical trial and they said this drug has a response for this many people for this treatment, and that's what they agreed to and they funded and then we find out it works for something else but do we fully understand the side effects because that wasn't the nature of the experiment when we did the clinical trial. So all this implies that to actually get involved in this as a consumer or as a patient you've actually got to give up quite a lot of data. Just the genome by itself isn't worth an awful lot. You've got to have your personal story Absolutely. in there. Yeah. And we've become very nervous about giving up our data. Yeah. Look, this is the challenge. There is a lot of data and the stewardship and the responsibility of the people who collect that data in, in the health system has to be to a very, very high standard, like higher than Google and Facebook, in my opinion. <laughs> um, and it's surprising that's, people... That's a high bar, is it? <laughs> uh, so I've been a technologist for a long time. I probably shouldn't comment. But I, I think one of the things we're doing is we're looking to understand the longitudinal value. So this is one of the big challenges for health. Health has traditionally captured information in paper. You know, it's paper records. If you go into the big hospitals, there's still a lot of paper. Now we've got all of this data because it's becoming computerised and we've got all that information. There's a really significant question to ask that says, well, how can that information be used to improve the healthcare system? We've got to have a way of having a dynamic consent process or a process that works where people can say, this is what I want to happen to my information. I want my information to be kept in use for my care. But perhaps I could also volunteer to have that information available appropriately de-identified or anonymous um, so that you, you can't tell you know, who it's about. So, uh, here's a provocative question. If the state, and I mean state means state or federal government, is actually going to pay for your genetic testing, can't it be part of the deal that you give up your data? That's kind of how I look at it. But I think it's important that consumers... Help I mean, as consumers, long as you know it's going to be safe and... The, the as long as they, but, but more importantly, that you've, you've actually been part of that conversation. So, yeah, I kind of believe that we have a universal health system and it's an amazing system and we get great care. And I do think it's part of the social contract, but I do think that it has to be backed on a conversation about the partnership and what a community wants to express. Because if there's an individual who says, that's not how I want my information to be handled and managed, they should have the right in a system like this to express that. Now, that might be hard where all that data is locked up in a file in cabinet somewhere, but now with the proliferation of the data and the technology, this is why it's so important to have this conversation about consent, which is about how someone expresses what they want to access that information and understand the value of having it shared for people like Nick in terms of research and for Shirag in terms of treating patients. Now, twin studies internationally have shown that, and including here in Queensland, QIMR has got a you know, worldwide reputation for its work on twins, where you compare identical twins to non-identical twins to see what might be genetic versus environmental. These studies suggest that even whether or not you like garlic, your preference for certain spices and diet is maybe 70% genetic. And some of that could actually have an influence on your, the diseases that you get or the, the treatment. And we're learning more and more about the gene patterns that predict garlic. I like Vindaloo, or I don't like, you know, I prefer shepherd's pie. But that may well have an influence, actually, on you know, in a funny kind of way, on whether or not you either get cancer or how well you do in certain treatments. How comprehensive are we getting with the picture of the genome as it relates to lifestyle and the things that we do that aren't medical? 
Yeah, I think that's, so this, this is a concept called potentially pharmacogenomics, I think is what you're pointing at. Um, there's also an, an, another concept that you're talking about, which is polygenic risk scores, which is the risk of common diseases and using that um, in, in, in a setting to manage um, sort of patient lifestyle or integrate that with lifestyle factors. I don't think we're there yet in that sort of space. I don't think we, we have a level of understanding what those things might mean. And also, yes, there is a genetic component. There's also a big lifestyle component. But if back to the issue of if you know your genetic risk and component, does that modify your lifestyle or not, and vice versa? And so if you take your area, go forward five or ten years, where's it going to be? Well, hopefully what we'd like to see is patients a being referred in. So, you know, the, there's a big issue with genomic literacy in the healthcare professionals. So patients are not even being identified as potentially having a genetic condition or being at risk, and therefore they don't then get referred on to the specialist teams, genetics teams or neurologists, etc. So that would be the first thing is really the patients accessing the healthcare system. And then hopefully as our technology is improving is applying that early on in their patient journey, limiting some of these other investigations that can then tailor some of the treatments that we've talked about identify potential risks that then could lead to lifestyle changes, etc. And Nick? Um, so moving that treatment from late stage disease into early stage, and that would be done either through improved screening, and that could be based on your genetic predisposition to cancer, whether you should get more screening or not, and also early detection of cancers through blood-based tests. So you pick up cancers earlier, you've got better chance of treating it, and better chance of giving the better drug to begin with. And how important will shared data be to that so that you actually, it's not just an individual test for an individual person, that we actually, in a de-identified way, can actually see what's happening in a mass scale? In incredibly important. The more data we have, the better. And we're looking at now using artificial intelligence to go and mine that data in a more meaningful way to pull out all the, all the key driving elements that are really there and deriving prognosis and treatment. I mentioned one of our projects looks at that sort of longitudinal information. We need it to be identifiable for people in terms of their own care. We need it de-identified, which means you can kind of re-identify for health system performance, and we need to make it anonymised appropriately for research purposes. So we've got to get all of that right and also look at advanced decision support system, addressing some of the challenges Shirag's brought out. So we have a very strong overlap with the digital health program or the digital hospital program here in Queensland, and also with uh, my health record people at the federal level as well. But I'm assuming that in five or 10 years, this, this is all normalised. <laughs> I would like to think that in five or ten years they don't need a program like the one I'm running where they go, well, this is an area because and it, there's going to be a lot of challenges. The, the health system is not quite sure how to respond. So we're going to invest to work out how to do that response. Our job is to embed that so that we have a learning system that's able to do this idea of disruption and change is just par for the course. And we've got to get rid of variation. I mean, I assume that nobody in this panel, if you've got a relative who unfortunately gets pancreas cancer, you would want them to have an exome sequence. And it's highly variable now in Queensland, Sydney, Melbourne, all the rest of the country, whether or not you'd get one. Yeah. It's pretty unfair. And there are similar alliances to the one we have in Queensland. There's one at the national level, the Australian Genomics Health Alliance, there's one in Melbourne. I was on the phone with a, a lot of different people from universities and hospitals and, and the health system in WA the other day. They want to look at the program we're doing here. Those alliances work together to try and share this information. We are all involved in working at the Australian Genomics Health Alliance as well. So that idea of how to pull together nationally and collaborate, indeed in purpose, is very much part of what we're trying to do. Can you please join me in thanking our fantastic panel? <laughs> David Bunker from Queensland Health, Dr Nick Waddell from QIMR, and Dr Shirik Patel from Genetic Health Queensland joining me on a precision medicine panel at the World Science Festival in Brisbane earlier this year. I'm Norman Swan, and that's it for the Health Report this week. Do join me next time.